This is episode 9 of Amos chapter 7. So here's Amos over here. He's a contemporary of Jonah who preached to Nineveh and was also a prophet to Israel and Hosea. So the three of them are contemporaries. And Amos was active around circa 760 to 753 BC, just seven years in total. He preached during the rule of King Uzziah of Judah, which is over here, who reigned for 52 years, and Jeroboam II of Israel, over here, who reigned for 41 years. And the reigns of the two kings overlapped about 15 years. The north and the south were at the zenith of their power. They both experienced national stability, prosperity, and the expansion of their kingdoms. So here's a recap for chapter 1, where uh, Amos decries Israel's enemies, and 1b, where he decries their cousins, basically their bloodlines, and you can pause and read this if you want to. Here's a recap of chapter 2, Judgment on Judah and Israel, Three, a prophet's authority. And four, Israel, prepare to meet your God. And you can pause and read this if you need the recap. Here's a recap on chapter five. Amos laments Israel. And you can pause and read this if you want to. God's appeal is seek me and live. Seek the Lord and live. And seek good, not evil, that you may live. And here's chapter six. And you can pause and read this uh, recap if you want to. Woe to the complacent. And we are now on chapter 7. So, this is the layout. We've done uh, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we're on chapter 7 now, the first three visions. So there's five visions in total. Visions of the locust, the fire, and the plumb line are in chapter 7. And then the summer fruit is chapter 8. And the stricken doorpost is chapter 9. So we're on chapter 7, these three visions here. So let's dive into chapter 7. The vision of locusts. Verse 1. Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. The Lord showed me. The Lord God showed me. God spoke to Amos through visions. He both saw and heard God's message. Amos has already exposed Israel's corrupt society, their pagan religious life, unjust social life, and their greedy political life. Now Amos sees ahead to where their nation is headed, and it is destruction. He formed locust swarms. One punishment that God is thinking of using is to send a huge swarm of locusts to completely overwhelm Jacob. And we know from the book of Joel that indeed a swarm of a size never before seen in the history of Judah had eaten every green thing in the southern kingdom. So God has done this before. Judah's locust damage, exacerbated by a drought, caused a devastating famine in the land which extended for years as the nation struggled to recover from the double whammy of locusts and drought. He formed locust swarms. Locust swarms. The word swarms has been interpreted to mean there will be two swarms of locusts with a short interval between them. And this fits with the life cycle of the locusts as I explained in my YouTube playlist, Joel, Chapter 1A. The implication is that there will be a swarm in the spring as the second shoot sprout and a late swarm with a regrowth before the second crop can be harvested. So the beginning of the late crop. The late crop is spring or the latter rains around March, April in the Mediterranean region. After the king's mowing, first the king's share was harvested, the grains and the early hay, which represented the royal taxes. The first swarm will arrive only after the king's crop has been harvested. Then the people's share came from the late spring crop, which also fed the flocks and herds, and the swarms would wipe out the new second growth. So you decide, does swarms mean one continuous swarm or two locust swarms at two intervals, just after the, the, the king's crop has been harvested and before the second one gets harvested will be the second swarm? In any case, God's deliberate timing meant maximum famine, both for the people and their livestock. For their apostasy, for breaking the Mosaic Covenant, they fall under the curses of God. He could wipe out the whole nation. Deuteronomy 28 is all the blessings and curses of God, and they fall under this one. Locusts shall consume all your trees and the produce of your land. Why? Because they broke their Mosaic Covenant. 
verse 2. And so it was when they finished eating the grass of the land that I said, O oh Lord God, forgive our prey. O oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. O oh Lord God, forgive our prey. Yeah, O oh Lord God, forgive our prey. Forgive is better translated as pardon. That is, give complete absolution of their crimes. With a pardon, there would be no need to punish or forgive. Amos is so horrified at the ferocity of the vision of locusts that in his anguish he intercedes on behalf of the northern kingdom. Please remove this potential judgment. Amos doesn't intercede based on Israel's religious merit because they don't have any. He prays only for God's grace. He doesn't appeal to the Lord's covenant relationship with Israel because they don't have any because their apostate behavior has negated all rights to such an appeal. Jacob, so he calls, oh, that Jacob may stand. Amos personalizes Israel. He uses a name that God especially blessed to remind God of his once great favor on the nation. Jacob the man, the limping schemer, who got the ugly sister in marriage, who wrestled with God until he got a special blessing, and everything he touched after that was blessed. A huge family, huge flocks, huge herds, a land of rivers and wells. Jacob the foundation of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what he's most known for. For he is small. The north is powerless to avoid the calamity of a locust plague. They do not have the reserves nor the resources to withstand such an onslaught. Even though Amos was denouncing the nation for their sin, he cannot stand by idly and watch it be utterly wiped out, which seems to be what his vision revealed, an extinction event of the nation. So he intercedes for them. He begs for mercy. Please pardon the nation. Verse 3. So the Lord relented concerning that. It shall not be, said the Lord. It shall not be. Because Amos interceded, the Lord comforted Amos and changed his mind. God stayed his hand and the curse of the locust swarm was lifted. But notice that forgiveness was not offered, just the stay of judgment. Verse 4. The vision of fire. Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Conflict by fire. God did it before, and he'll do it again. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire. Now Amos sees that same fate for the northern kingdom. Deuteronomy 32, For a fire is kindled in my anger, and shall burn to the lowest hell. It shall consume the earth and her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. In the Bible, divinely directed fire either completely purifies or it completely destroys. It's never just a partial impact. Isaiah 66, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. The great deep, it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Biblically, the abyss is always associated with the sea. Thus, this could be the Mediterranean Sea to their west, or even the deep underground floodwaters that we read about regarding Noah's flood. Devoured the territory. This could be a volcanic eruption, and its lava flows over the land, obliterating everything in its path. Or an all-consuming wildfire sweeping over the land, licking up all life. The territory could be the promised land, or more precisely, that which grew on the land that could be consumed by fire. The prophet Joel had prophesied to the southern kingdom about their judgment, which was first locusts, then fire. Now God is thinking about repeating the same set of punishments on the northern kingdom. Joel chapter 1, O oh Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. Whichever way God sins, it's not going to be good. Verse 5, Then I said, O Lord God, cease, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. Once again, Amos is horrified at the vision of this possible second extinction event and throws himself down to again intercede on behalf of the northern kingdom. Please refrain or forego this judgment. Again, his prayers are based on God's mercy and grace and not because Israel deserved to have their punishment deferred. Remember, Amos is from Judah, the southern kingdom, yet his heart is for all the twelve tribes of Israel, so he beseeches God to preserve the north. 
In the first vision, Amos asked God to pardon Israel. But now he's dropped that elevated plea to just cease, refrain, forego. Verse 6. So the Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. For a second time, God stays his hand and comforts and consoles Amos, and the judgment of fire was lifted. Again, Amos tells the people of this vision he saw a fire, but the people are unmoved by his intercession. Maybe they thought the vision of fire and locusts were for another time, for another nation. After all, Amos had started his ministry in the north by decrying their enemies. Syria, Philistine lands, the giants, Lebanon, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Maybe these visions were meant for them. David Parson points out that not only does prayer change things, it changes God's mind. And Amos' prayers do both. They change things and his mind. So the critical implication is that prayer changes outcomes. One time I watched a video short of a woman watching a monster tornado barreling towards her home. And she put her hand on the window, prayed fervently and spoke tongues, and this huge, furious tornado suddenly veered away. It was, it was an amazing video. So the next crucial implication is that prayer changes God. We can change God's mind through prayer. Today in 2024, there are hundreds of thousands of people all over the world, probably tens of millions of people, on their knees pleading to God to save our planet from greedy, corrupt, and reprobate globalists. And the first signs of change are that some judges, not all, are beginning to judge with fairness and impartiality. And once the justice system is corrected, it snowballs from there, and slowly, good will replace evil. Amos chapter 7 proves that prayer can change things and people and the mind of God. Why? Because God wants a real relationship with us. He wants us to be his family and him to be our father. Why? Because he loves us. God gives us the authority through his son Jesus to approach his throne of grace and intercede through prayer. And justice should be blind, fair and impartial. Vision of the plumb line. This vision is symbolic. It's not literal. It's not real. Verse 7. Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. A plumb line is a string with a non-magnetic weight connected to one end, like this. When the line is held so that the weight can dangle freely, an exact vertical can be assured. A plumb line applies the law of gravity to find the straight path from top to bottom and keeps things plumb or level. All work must line up with a plumb line or gamble on being crooked. And I'll put this in for fun because I know it's not, that's not the reason. This building, Leaning Tower of Pisa, it was actually at a, a dangerous angle, sort of like that. And, and they were convinced it was going to fall down any minute now. How it actually stayed erect at that angle, nobody knew. But they got world engineers to come in and have a look. And they found that what was the problem was that the ground on this side of the, the tower was not, uh, was soft. And so the, tower was slowly over the centuries sliding into the the, the the soil and so they pumped cement in and they kept and it was away at an angle and they kept pumping cement in and pumping it upright and of course they don't want it to be straight upright because it's known as the leaning tower of pisa it's famous worldwide for being leaning so they pumped it up until it was at a point where it was no longer in danger of falling <laughs> so i know it's not the plumb line at all. i just put that in for fun so a wall made with a plumb line God's people, his chosen nation, had been built true to plumb. The nation had the community rules to live by, the Ten Commandments, and God had placed her in the promised land. She should have been perfect after all the nurturing that the Lord had done to her and for her. But the nation had fallen into apostasy. God is measuring how far out of whack the people are, how far off the plumb line of good versus evil. For Jeroboam the first to Jeroboam the second, God had spared the kingdom for 170 years, 931 B.C. to 761 B.C. But now they are just too evil to continue. Amos knows that the people are very proud of their fortifications and their city walls. The imagery here of verse 7 is of God standing on their walls and like the people, their fortifications are out of plumb and will collapse just as the nation will collapse.
verse 8. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. A plumb line in the midst of my people. At the time of Amos, the north was in their 210th year and clearly not upright. God expected them to be true to the standards he had set them, but socially, politically, and religiously, they were completely out of plumb. Romans 3, paraphrasing, it's the straight edge of the law that shows us how crooked we are. And anything that is built crooked, that is not upright, must come down. My people Israel. My people Israel. This is the first time in the book of Amos that the Lord calls Israel my people. I will not pass them by anymore. Yet Israel has run out of chances. Their evil has come up before God and he will not overlook their offenses. The nation is out of plumb and must be pulled down. And it will happen. God said so. Verse 9. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. Isaac is the poetic name for Israel. Isaac was the father of Jacob, and God renamed Jacob as Israel. So this is kind of poetry. So God says they will have three judgments, regardless of the favor that God had for the patriarchs. Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the patriarchs. The nation is now pagan and God will demolish their man-made false religious system, their corrupt leaders and their royal line, all gone. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate. Isaac was Jacob's father, which is a peculiar way to reference Jacob equals Israel. This reference is found only in Amos. It's kind of poetic. So the high places was the place of their leisure and social life. It was where the people went to worship Baal. Their worship usually also included pagan sex acts. These places would be destroyed, just a heap of ruins, covered in weeds, desolate. Sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. The sanctuaries, their temples, were centers of religious pretension and would be utterly wiped out, laid to waste. The north had defiled the sacred sites of Bethel, Gilead, and Beersheba, which completely dishonored the holy God. The people took pilgrimages there, to bow to Baal, practice sorcery, and enact perversions. Amos 5, we're in Amos 7 right now, Amos 5, but do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Bathsheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. So we already covered chapter 5. I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. Now Amos addresses their political haughtiness. Until now, Amos has been speaking to the people of the nation, but now he zeroes in on one man, the king. I will rise, I will rise. Emphasizes that God himself will choreograph the downfall of the king, his dynasty, and all his kingdom. Why? Because Jeroboam I led the people into idolatry with his golden calves. And every king since then, including the current Jeroboam II, had persisted with this man-made religion. When the Bible says punishment will be with the sword, with the sword, it's generally for very serious violations against the Mosaic Covenant. Like their paganism, tangling and mixing a one true God with Baal. What an insult. God created the entire universe and a little God is just a stick whittled into a shape and taken from a tree that God created. Amos did not pray to stop these judgments. So God's judgment stands. History tells us that Jeroboam II died naturally, and his son and successor, Zechariah, reigned for only six months Then he was assassinated. So God said, I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. Wipe out him and his bloodline. Amaziah's opposition. So verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. He's even got the ephod thing. Amaziah was the recognized head of the establishment religion. The selected, not anointed, high priest of the desecrated Bethel site 
took umbrage at Amos, the true prophet, for declaring God's anger against this now unholy place. It's Bethel was where they where Jeroboam the, the first put the, the golden calf. So Amos, the amateur prophet, and Amaziah, the professional priest, confront each other, and very quickly the argument turns political. Amos was concerned with reform, and Amaziah was ritual. Amos was ordained by God, and the priest was elected by man. This clash is between the true messenger of God and a priest with his vested interest in the false state religion. As such, Amos was the plumb line to Amaziah, the crooked priest. Amos has conspired against you. Amos has conspired against you. Amaziah succinctly summarizes Amos's message, of course, to Amos's detriment. Amaziah accuses Amos of treason, a very explosive denunciation that demands the king's attention. Prophets wielded serious power in ancient Israel, and Amos is accused of a conspiracy to provoke rebellion. There was a precedent for this, and when the prophet Elisha sent the son of a prophet to anoint the army commander Jehu as king of Israel, and Jehu was to overthrow King Ahab to avenge God's prophets who were murdered by Ahab's wife, Jezebel. And King Jeroboam II, also a king of Israel, because Ahab Jehu was made king of Israel, would know this history. When Jeremiah preached a similar message, they put him in prison for treason. The Pharisees took Jesus before Pilate to condemn him, but Pilate washed his hands of their scheming. And Amaziah denounced Amos to King Jeroboam II in the hope that the monarch would condemn Amos. Amos had spent years hammering the leadership of Israel, denouncing their false religion, decrying their corruption and injustices, and telling them all to prepare to meet your God. So the king probably believed Amaziah. However, Amos was not conspiring. Amaziah was lying. He omits to mention to the king that twice Amos has interceded for the nation, so he was actually on their side. The land is not able to bear. The people were perhaps getting uncomfortable with Amos' prophecy and maybe wondered how much truth was in his words. Perhaps there were murmurings. Thus, Amos' preaching discomforted the priest who preferred peaceful platitudes. Verse 11. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their land. And he did say that. Jeroboam will die. This statement could also get the king's attention because it sounds like a conspiracy, right? Amos's position in Bethel had become precarious. History tells us that although Jeroboam II died naturally, his dynasty, the house of Jeroboam, in verse 9 that says, were all murdered. Verse 12. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy. Flee to the land. Scram! Go back to your own kingdom. The north at this time was immensely wealthy, highly sophisticated, and very elitist. Judah, on the other hand, was regarded as conservative country hicks. Amaziah and Amos are now contending face to face, and in the religious temple, no less, right there where the king himself would worship. This elitist priest found it galling to have to listen to God's spokesman from the southern kingdom, which for Amaziah added insult to injury. There eat bread. Amaziah dismissed Amos as a prophet for hire, not to be taken seriously. Prophets of that time earned their living by prophesying, by acting as the intercessor between God and the people. Amaziah tells Amos to go back home and hire himself out in Judah. But this is Amaziah's own personal sin, funny how you always accuse other people of your own sins. And this is Amaziah's personal sin, since he earned his living working for cash. He was handsomely paid by a patron like a king to deliver feel-good messages to placate the nation. Verse 13, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. Never again prophesy at Bethel. When Solomon's United Kingdom split, Jeroboam I didn't want his people to travel to Jerusalem to worship in the temple there. So he created two golden calves and placed one in Bethel and one in Dan, 
bracketing his kingdom in idolatry. He selected a bunch of men to act as priests, so head up his man-made religion, and the North's worship sank into apostasy. Since one of the golden calves was in Bethel, it had become the king's sanctuary, and his palace was there. And Amaziah didn't want Amos stirring up discord in Bethel with his gloomy prophecies. This was a concern for both the high priest and the king. It's the king's sanctuary. The sanctuary in Bethel was Jeroboam's royally authorized replacement temple. Amaziah served the king there, so he would not want Amos prophesying doom and gloom at the royal sanctuary. Verse 14. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. I was no prophet. Amos denied any connection with the guild of prophets or their classically trained disciples. He was not a professional prophet, unlike Amaziah, who was a career priest and likely the son of a long line of career priests. No one had hired Amos to come to the northern kingdom and pronounce judgment on the people and their king. Amos's calling was directly from God. I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Amos points out that he's a sheep breeder, a shepherd, and likely in charge of a team of shepherds who tended his flocks for him. The Hebrew uses a different word for shepherd, one not found elsewhere in the Old Testament. The word relates to cattle, suggesting Amos may also have had a herd of beef. Amos adds that he had an orchard of figs in the lower region, not in Tekoa where he lived because they didn't grow there, they only grew in the lower regions. So he was a substantial landowner, with land for his livestock, land where he lived, and more land for his orchards. That's how he earned his living, with flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, and an orchard of figs that were rare for that region because they didn't grow in that region. And obviously it gave him a good living, in fact a comfortable life, because he preached to the north for seven years, living off his own private income. Verse 15. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel, as I followed the flock. This statement stresses the location of the shepherd, rather than his activity. Amos' calling was an unexpected, very sudden, divine calling. To Samuel 7, just like David, who'd been suddenly called from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, and anointed by Samuel to be ruler over Israel. Both Amos and David had been out in the field with their flocks when God called them, one to be a prophet, the other to be a king. Both these offices were always a calling from God for true prophets and kings. Deuteronomy 17, when you come to the land which your, the Lord your God is giving you, you shall surely set a king of you whom the Lord your God chooses. Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses, from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear or pay attention to. Now Amos was in Bethel only because God had sent him there and Amos obeyed God. The Lord said to me, go prophesy. Amos' intention is not to earn a living in the north, but to deliver God's unvarnished message. Verse 16. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. Amos has listened to this pompous Amaziah, and now he goes on the offensive. You're trying to shut me up? Now listen to what is going to happen to you and yours. You say do not prophesy against Israel. For years Amos had been warning that God would not turn back his wrath because the priests had corrupted the people. In chapter 2 Amos said, For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Also in chapter 2, But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophet saying, Do not prophesy. And in chapter 4, Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, prepare to meet your God. And here we are in chapter 7, and he's still warning them. Against Israel. Amaziah does not want Amos to speak against Israel. Amos does not speak of nice things, but of nasty things that will befall them. And Amaziah doesn't want to hear this. So Amos says, if you don't want to hear anything against Israel, then hear this against yourself. You and yours are done for. 
Verse 70, Therefore thus says the Lord, Your wife shall be a harlot in the city, your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword, your land shall be divided by survey line, you shall die in a defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away, captive from his own land. Therefore thus says the Lord. I mean, isn't that a terrifying statement? For the crime of Amaziah attempting to muzzle a true prophet of God, Amos reads him the riot act. He delivers a blistering rebuke and condemns the self-righteous priest. Amos tells him that his wife, his children, and his land will all be lost. With the violent deaths of all his children, his bloodline comes to an end. With the exile of Amaziah, his wife will be left destitute and reduced to prostitution to survive. His private estate would be divided up and given to others. So now he has no heirs and no inheritance. And all Israel, as well as its king and nobles and high society, all will be taken away to captivity in a foreign land. You shall die in a defiled land. The Hebrews had a whole ritual that had to be performed when a loved one died. There was a week of mourning accompanied in Jewish culture by a large tradition of beliefs, rituals, and other responses. According to Jewish tradition, a cemetery is a holy place, more sacred even than a synagogue. So none wanted to be buried in a defiled land, which belonged to a nation that has no covenant relationship with God. But Amaziah would die and be buried in a defiled land for daring to confront God's prophet and suppress God's message. Led away captive from his own land. Amos repeats the curse of verse 11, which I've written in here again. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. So this one is, your, your land will be divided, you shall die in a defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive. And verse 11, Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely be led away. Amos has still not defined or named the enemy. Amaziah was supposedly the representative of God in Israel, but his crime was to tell Amos, the true representative of God, to get out of Israel. That's why Amaziah's punishment was so serious. Amaziah pushed God out of his land, so God would push Amaziah out of his own land. And in 722, although Amos has not named who the enemy is, it's Assyria. Now this is interesting. The Hebrews always look to be buried in the promised land, the land of the patriarchs, and not in a foreign land. According to the Talmud, being buried in the land of Israel brings a certain measure of atonement for sins. Genesis 49, regarding Jacob's death and burial, Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in a cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. Even today, Jew Jewish people will fly their loved ones to Israel to be buried there. I remember watching a, a video, and they were interviewing Netanyahu, and he took them to his parents' grave, and he said, these are my parents, and he was very, I don't know where they are, but he, he actually, that's where he took them, to show the people, this is where my parents are buried. So today, Jewish people will even fly their loved ones to Israel to be buried there. One of the fundamental tenets of the Jewish faith is that the dead will come to life once again in the era of Mashiach, the Messiah. The Talmud explains that all the dead will be resurrected in the land of Israel. The bodies of those who are buried outside of Israel will burrow through the earth until they reach Israel, and there their souls will be reinstated in their bodies. For the especially righteous, special tunnels will form beneath the ground to make the journey easier and more dignified. In order to avoid this whole process, Many choose to be buried in the soil of Israel. According, This is all according to Shabbat.org. So they'll even fly them to Israel to be buried there. You can go how to arrange for burial in Israel. And so you can actually arrange that. So note, in our modern Bibles, chapter 717 ends this chapter. However, the visions are interrupted, but for consistency's sake, I'll follow our modern Bible layout. So Amos' visions continue in chapter 8 for the summer fruit, chapter 9 for the stricken doorpost. And like the plumb line vision, these are symbolic, not real. They're not literal. So this is the end of episode 9, chapter 7, visions 1, 2, and 3. The righteous anger of God. You just don't want to get in front of an angry God. Wow. There are 25... Bible verses about the anger of God and the consequences 
of getting in front of an angry God. You just don't want to do that. So let me bless you before you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Shalom. Follow me to chapter 8.